Thank you, Mike. Wow, what a build-up. Wow. It's all downhill from here after that, isn't it? So um, it's lovely to be with you. Lovely drive over here from West Bridgeford. Got my passport stamped on the way up. Never been to Mansfield Baptist Church. 31 years I've been journeying with this association and been part of it in West Bridgeford Baptist Church and then at New Life, uh, well, Lady Bay and then at New Life. So um, amazing. I've never been to Mansfield Baptist. Sorry about that. Because it's obviously... Have I? Oh, my word. Did I preach here? That's so bad. I'm a wanderer, by the way, so you, you might have to want to watch out for that. Sorry about that. It's, um, that's really bad. Sorry, Mansfield Baptist Church. I've got a really bad memory. It's my age. I'm a funny age. Um, it was a lovely drive over here. Uh, if you came the, the, the Mappley way, those of you who came from that direction, aren't the trees beautiful today? Isn't it lovely? Let's sit in a room with no view outside today all day, shall we? Yes, let's. Um, it's great to have you here. Uh, association day, hey? Who's here at an association day for the first time ever? What? It's a lot of people, right? Have you any idea what you've come to? No. <laughs> Somebody was saying to me, what, what, what is an association day? Thank you to my guys from New Life who've come. Whoa, excellent. Talk to these guys over here, Alan and Sylvia and Pam, if you want to know what a renewed space is. Or to the guys from Hocknall who are running a really good one. Or if there's anyone from Ruddington who's got one going, and you'll know a bit more about it. Um, my story, uh, very briefly, for those who don't know it, and I won't be just talking about renewed well-being, but I know some of you are quite interested, so I'll just put myself in context. Born in the Isle of Man, born and raised in a Brethren church, and uh, then found myself here in Nottingham, um, part of Westbridge for Baptist Church, in its absolute heyday of growth and charismatic renewal. Uh, that was a bit scary. And uh, I've been brought up where uh, busyness is next to godliness, and so I worked really hard, and I spent a lot of years working really hard. Married my lovely husband, Mark, uh, three children who are now grown up, and uh, taught full-time as a teacher at a primary school. I was loving all of that. You might have spotted where the story's heading. Uh, leading in the church during a time of growth and seven congregations. I was loving it all large. I didn't do anything by halves. And then I suddenly realised overnight, in fact, I usually take my cup with me, not because I get more coffee in it, although you do, but um, because... It's a bit wonky, and I haven't realised that overnight my I'm a cup full to the brim person had just emptied out overnight. And, and overnight I became quite ill, and uh, for about a year, no voice, uh, low mood, tucked in my bed. It was a really bad year, about 10 years ago. Weirdly, during that time, the richest time of my life, really, because during that time when I couldn't do anything and I didn't know who I was anymore, I got my identity too much about I was a teacher and I was a leader and I was Ruth and I was woohoo and all of that stuff, just none of it. And I never knew if I'd ever get it back again. And um, I remember having this moment where I felt like God got in next to me, got his arms around me and said, Ruth, I couldn't love you anymore and I'll never love you any less. And I was doing nothing. And I wrote in my journal that day, I would rather never get well again and keep this intimacy than go back to what I was like before. It was life-changing for me. And um, on the back of that, New Life Baptist Church appointed me to be their minister. How mad was that? And, um, and so we knew we were having an adventure together over the last 10 years that would involve vulnerability. Because during the time I hadn't been well, I had met loads and loads of people who were much more unwell than me and who remained so. Mental ill health, as you know, there's a tsunami of mental and emotional ill health across the country with our young people. One in four people with a diagnosis of mental ill health and, and more anxiety. 73% of people recently said they feel so stressed some days that they don't know how to cope. That's, not, that's just people in normal days. And that will be 73% of us, right? Yeah. So, interestingly, uh, I just couldn't believe that during that time when I wasn't well and church didn't feel like a very good place to be because everybody was like patting you and praying for you, you know, like, oh. My friend actually made me a sign that said, stop patting me, I'm not a dog. Because <laughs> I couldn't speak. So, and you know that, like, we, we mean well, but we're like hugging and praying and, oh, are you, all, how are, are you all right now? No. And the church was so <laughs> desperate for me to be okay that they didn't know how, for me, how to love me. Well, they did. They did. They tried really hard to love me when I was not okay, but it didn't feel very safe. And that's my beautiful new life who I love. The church that I, I led then went on to lead. It didn't feel safe to be there. 
And it made me think about all those vulnerable people in our communities, all of those people who come under those categories, uh, and all the amazing things that we're doing as churches. And don't get me wrong, I am not coming at you with a big stick today to say try harder. I've visited churches all over the country in the last couple of years. You're amazing. God hasn't got a better plan. It is my only one message, if you hear nothing else, is God really loves his bride. I mean, loves you. That The best plan he's got for, for the, the loneliness and isolation out there is still the church. However, if we're working really hard and it's not serving the most vulnerable person, then is there a different way? Would Jesus cross the road for somebody else who was not okay? I think so. So all I'm doing is telling my story of brokenness and then seeing all the nodding heads going, yeah, me too, me too. And then, is there something else we could do, something different we can do? Could we slow down? Is there a way in which the church prophetically is the missing link right now in the, in the well-being tsunami that's going on? And so with my wonderful little church, and I have to say, I, I, there's nothing quite like New Life Baptist Church, because they just went, what? It's like a white knuckle ride with me as the leader, because I'm going, shall we try this? Oh, let's try this. So I kind of came, when I came back to health, I was determined we would try something that would work better. Better. We did a lot of things wrong, a lot. Meeting in a pub, that I loved. I used to pull pints and the, and the landlord used to join in with all the stuff and we loved it, but it was not safe for the most vulnerable people who joined us and the landlord had to tell me that. And it was like, oh yeah, you're right, they're staying here all day drinking after we've had church here. Sounds like a really missional fun idea. It actually wasn't God's idea at all. It was our idea of something fun. And we tried loads of things and eventually God slowed us down and showed us one little thing. During the time I hadn't been well, I'd come across some habits that had done me loads of good. Habits that involved a cup, which is why I'm holding one. My first cup of coffee in the morning, sit still till you've finished it. Remind yourself of those days when you could do nothing and the world still turned on its axis. Stillness, silence, psalms. Just sit with a psalm, take a phrase from the psalm, chew it over in your head. I was a worrier, I am a worrier, but that's only negative meditation. So choose something else to fill your mind with each day. Make it good and true. And then let the other thoughts orbit around it. It's not thought control. It's just kept me alive for 10 years. The habit of having a little tiny chunk of scripture that I can actually remember. Because it's not that I don't read the rest of the Bible. Don't get me wrong. I don't just read five words of a psalm. But I do know that the five words of the psalm this week are about the oil of gladness. And I know that's about Jesus, and I know that we get Jesus' oil of gladness on us. And so this week, as I sit with my cup, any time I pick up a cup, I then just remind myself, it's his oil of gladness that's on us. He anoints us with his oil of gladness. And next week, I'll have a different phrase, and that'll keep me alive for a week, and I'll keep meditating on that. And what I found during the time that I was doing this was that my friends who I'd made, who were really unwell... Um, that was the only thing that kind of worked, was saying, do you want to do this meditation with me? I've got nothing else. There was a time when I had, um, I've told some of you about this before, but there was a lovely, lovely girl in our church um, who was a um, young lady, single mom, dying of cancer. And we prayed like crackers that she would be healed, and she wasn't. And I was invited to a women's group, and her mum was there. And her mum was well angry, like She'd been brought up in Welsh Baptist chapel enough to put her off God forever. And she sat there looking at me across this women's group. And I'd been invited in as the minister, right? Because I knew what the answers were. And I had no idea what to say. I don't know if you were there, Sue, but it was just like, I don't know what to say. And this woman's looking at me all angry across the room. And uh, she said, I've lost one daughter to suicide and I'm losing another to cancer. Where's your God now? What have you got? Well, all I had was my meditation, and it happened to be, you are my stronghold. So I said, let's just close our eyes, take our cup in our hands, and say, you are my stronghold. Just sit quiet for a while. And I sat quiet for far too long, because I was like, I don't want to open my eyes. I've got nothing. And when I opened my eyes, tears were running down her face. She ran across the room. She hugged me, and she said, he's my stronghold, Ruth. All through Kirsty's funeral, all the way through it, she held on to those few words that changed her life. I didn't understand what had happened. I'm brought up in a good evangelical tradition where she should have had an alpha course before that. I mean, what's, what's happened? God has encountered people where our words were not helpful. And there's something about the still places and the quiet places of prayer that I wanted to see on the high street. It felt to me then, in that moment, like that should be available on prescription, right? So we set about trying to find somewhere where we could have a quiet space and a bit more of a kind of activity space where people could do hobbies and, and, and join in what they would normally be doing on their own, but they could do it together. 
Um, and at the same time, I've been running around, moaning away to the mental health team in, our, in Rushcliffe about people who are in our church who were just not getting enough care in the community. I don't know if you're familiar with this, ministers, but I think you will be. And I was just really angry that some people felt that they had no option other than to try and take their own lives because it was the only way to get any attention. Um, and I met some amazing people in the mental health system who were doing their best. Honestly, they were doing their best. They didn't go into it to do a bad job. It's just too much. So instead of just moaning, we thought we'd join in. So we developed a partnership with somebody in the Rushcliffe mental health team. And we got offered a little cafe space in West Bridgeford that some of you might know about. And we were offered it by the cafe owners who are not Christians, who wanted to work with us because they were worried about loneliness and isolation, people of peace. And next door came up for let and blessed New Life Baptist Church. They gave up their plans to have a nice building to put their chairs in rows and park their cars and put their handbags under their seats. And they took on a rent that is very expensive on a little shop on the high street that most of them will never use for vulnerable people to come for anyone who's feeling lonely to come and start up a hobby, share a hobby, do something for their well-being, a place where you're known by your name, not your label, where they could join in the rhythms of quiet prayer three times a day, psalm, Lord's Prayer, examine at the end of the day, and where the mental health team could come and go, and it could be a non-clinical space where you could get the advice you needed. You might have spotted I set up a space I needed. <laughs> it's very selfish. Authentically, I needed to calm down and pray. I needed to do some hobbies that weren't church. And I needed access to the mental health team without having to admit it. So the authenticity of the space came around my own vulnerability, really. And then people joined in. And it became a lovely space to hang out. It still is. Three years on, I think there's about 120 people go through the doors every week. There's 30 to 40 regulars who come back more than once in the week. And uh, it's just hanging out and being human together. Um, there aren't any volunteers. We're all humans. There are some hosts who keep it safe and there are regulars. And you wouldn't know who was who when you come in because in the area of mental health, there is no them and us. There is no church and community. We're all human. We cannot fix this one and therefore it's a gift to us. This is where we as church come alongside our communities and go, yeah, me too. I was a Christian leader when I had my breakdown. So I had to learn from my atheist friend who is an OT in the mental health team how to look after myself. And then she wanted to learn from me what it looked like to uniquely Christianly do that. But where your faith in practice actually makes people feel more unwell because we're so busy that we have to add ourselves onto the rotors. You know, when Milton Jones, the comedian, he, he says the church is a bit like a helicopter. Sometimes we don't want to get too close and, in case we get pulled into the rotors. You know, it's that. So it's that, it's that idea that surely the way in which we can prophetically live and prophetically be God's people is exactly what is needed right now. So that's my little preamble is what does well-being look like to you? Three years on, I had to give up the day job a year ago and set up as a little charity, Renew Wellbeing, to help other churches who were asking for help to set these up. I don't go looking. It's a bit like therapy. You can't tell somebody they need it. <laughs> they have to come and ask. So I've never gone looking for churches to come and work with us, but we've now got 18 cafes nationally uh, set up doing the same things as Renew 37 in lots of very different ways. And if you're interested in doing one and becoming one, just take some information and get in touch with me because I'm not going to talk more about it. I'll show you a little film at the end of the day. But what I am going to do is unravel the journey I took a little bit to maybe help you to see the one thing, the thing that God might be calling you and your church to. We've called it, what do we call it again, this thing? See it, hear it, live it. And well, way back, I've never been to a more organised day in my life, by the way, all hail Becky Nichols and the team, because this is really, be they have been planning this for you for such a long time. And uh, so when I came up with this, oh, let's do this, when we together came up with the see it, hear it, live it, I hadn't thought about the connotations, which are, if you've ever travelled by train, which I do a lot now, it's quite irritating, isn't it? The see it, say it, sort it. Have you heard that? Okay. It's a little bit ambiguous, because it sounds like they're saying, see it, say it, sort it. So if you see something dangerous, tell somebody and then sort it out yourself. Doesn't it sound like that? Right? It's not. It's actually see it, say it, sorted, because they will sort it out. And actually think we might have happened upon something here. 
Because what we're going to see today by the eyes of faith, what we're going to talk about amongst ourselves about what we're seeing around us, what we're hearing from God, we might go away today thinking, right, sort it. Come on, church, try harder. I, I have to tell you, you have tried really hard. There is a different way. You are not coming here to hear that missional enterprise is a big stick to beat you with to try a bit harder. There is another way. God is kind and good and he loves his church and it is time to join in. But it's not going to make us iller. It is going to make us better. <laughs> see it, say it, sort it. Hear it, see it, hear it, live it is what we're going with. So you've heard a little of my story. I'll bring this into it in a minute. This isn't just because I don't do technology, but I really don't do technology. So I bring a, I'm still a primary school teacher at heart. When you go away, you'll go, I've no idea what she said, but what was that tree? And then you might remember what the tree was. Um, you see, the thing is, a lot of what we do as the church, and I want you to engage with whatever God tells you to do, and there is stuff to do, but we're not the fourth emergency service and neither can we sustain that. And there is something uniquely beautiful about the church because we are the bride of Christ, where we bring something peaceful and calm and we know that he will do it, not us. And there's something lovely about getting in step with the Spirit of God. But it seems to me with all the crises that we are meeting across the nation, and there are many, mental ill health being one of them, and we are going to talk about some of them, we need to listen to the words of Archbishop Desmond Tutu, who said, it's no good just pulling people out of the river. We need to go upstream and find out why they're falling in. And so there's something about the way in which we live prophetically as a church, the community of church, that we need to ask ourselves some big questions about right now, because I hear a world, and I think you do too, that is crying out for the good stuff that is in us. When I started working with the mental health team, I learned that there was a really good piece of research that most mental health professionals use. And it is uh, the New Economics Foundation, Five Ways to Wellbeing. And these five ways to wellbeing were so well researched, big piece of research, and they are used nationally to help people with their wellbeing. And this is what they are. Let's see if you can spot the church in this. Connecting, keeping learning, getting active, taking notice and giving, connecting, keeping learning, getting active, taking notice, giving. Did you spot that? I did. The minute I heard them, I said, well, the church has been doing that for years. Trouble is, we kind of do it in a box where nobody knows how to get at it. And then we run out of the box and we do some stuff with people and then we run back in the box again. And, and so the renew spaces are just ways of opening up the box a bit and saying, we're doing that anyway, guys, please come and join us. Or at least are we uh, maybe we are. Are we trying to at least? Um, and that's the beautiful thing about the church. So see it, say it sorted, or see it, hear it, live it. I'm hoping you don't go away at the end of the day feeling heavy about any of this. Because the good news is we're going to actually look at the Bible, so that's all good. We're going to look at the Bible, and I'm taking you to Jeremiah. So if we just have the words of this up for people who need it. Um, Jeremiah chapter 1 was one of my calling passages into ministry. Um, and this is what it says. See, because what, what we see, Jeremiah is invited to say what he sees. That's why we're going to look at this. But what we see is not always what it actually is, right? I, I was in uh, South Sea in Portsmouth last week. And um, I was visiting a church and I took my car into a car park. And above the car park, it said 1.8 meters. And I thought, that's fine, yeah. I've got a roof box on, but I knew it was less than 1.8 metres in my head. I looked at the 1.8 metres. I visually looked at my car from inside it, like it's really hard to do, and went, yeah, much less than that. Not less than that, no, not less than that at all. And so when you're stuck, completely stuck. Now, the guy who did see what was happening was the workman who was standing watching me as I grounded my car to a complete halt and was trapped in a car park where people couldn't get out and they couldn't get in. I was very popular and I was due at a meeting. And I'd driven all the way to Portsmouth for a meeting that I was then going to be late for because I was stuck in a car park. But the guy who was watching me could see it because he was seeing it from a different angle. And sometimes what we see, we don't see when we're inside it. And so for the church, we're not sometimes seeing... Because we're in a kind of a, a kind of an Eden project biome, really. Sometimes we're going, this is safe in here. 
And now we need to go out there and get the people that aren't safe and we need to bring them in here. But actually, I think God's at work. Well, what I'm finding with the mental health teams in the cafes, God's already at work. What we're doing is joining in with him. Um, and so I know you know that, but um, I feel at ease today because he's already doing some things. We're just trying to spot what they are so that we can join in, so that we're not exhausting ourselves doing stuff God isn't doing. Jeremiah 1. The words of Jeremiah, son of Hilkiah, I'm not going to read all that, it's got lots of long names. Verse 4, the word of the Lord came to me saying, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. So Jeremiah is a prophet, an Old Testament prophet, you'll know this. And uh, he is just hearing his call to prophesy. Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I consecrated you. I appointed you a prophet to the nations. Then I said, Oh, Lord God, behold, I don't know how to speak. I'm only a youth. And the Lord said to me, don't say I'm only a youth. For to all to whom I send you, you shall go. And whatever I command you, you shall speak. Do not be afraid of them. For I am with you to deliver you, declares the Lord. Then the Lord put out his hand and touched my mouth. And the Lord said to me, behold, I have put my words in your mouth. See, I have set you this day over nations and over kingdoms to pluck up and to break down, to destroy and to overthrow, to build and to plant. And the word of the Lord came to me saying, Jeremiah, what do you see? And I said, I see an almond branch. And the Lord said to me, you've seen well, for I am watching over my word to perform it. And then the word of the Lord came to me a second time saying, what do you see? And I said, oh, I see a boiling pot facing away from the north. And the Lord said, out of the north, disaster shall come. Now, Jeremiah's calling is <laughs> not one that I think I want you to have right now, or he does either, because Jeremiah's calling was to be a prophet of doom, the weeping prophet. So we're looking at an Old Testament prophet, but we're understanding it looking back through the lens of Christ. So I'm not saying to you right now, then God's going to call each of you out from here to prophesy doom over the things that are awful in the world. And sometimes, just sometimes, that's what the church does. That's what I was doing with the mental health team. I was calling them on it. I was moaning at them about it, but I wasn't standing alongside them in it. I was coming Old Testament prophecy wise and saying, this is bad. It's not that we don't speak out for injustice. It's how do we do it? How do we do it in Jesus' humility? How do we do it from the other side of the cross? What does it look like for us who know the bit that Jeremiah also prophesied, which was, if you look at Jeremiah 31, I'm going to have a new covenant. The days are coming, says the Lord, when I'll make a new covenant. My covenant that they broke, though I was their husband, says the Lord. For this is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel after those days. I will put my law in them. I will write it on their hearts. I will be their God. They will be my people. And no longer shall each one teach his neighbor and say, and each his brother saying, know the Lord. For they shall all know me from the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. And I will forgive their sins and I will remember their sin no more. We live the other side, a new covenant, in new covenant. Aren't you glad? Oh, I'm glad. So in terms of what we see in the world around us, and we are going to look at that, we first need to see him as he is. When, we, when people say to me, I don't believe in God, I'll say, what God don't you believe in? And then when they tell me, I'll go, oh, I don't believe in that God either. We, 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 the church, over the years and the centuries, have given an image of God that isn't actually the God of the Bible. Because we've got a bit confused and because we've tried our best, and I do think people are trying their best, I think sometimes we've misrepresented God. He seems a bit cross with us and we're not really trying hard enough at best. And then you look at this passage and you realise we live the other side of where we will all know him and he will love us. And the fact of the cross and the resurrection is everybody's in if they want to be in, right? The gospel is great news because it genuinely is okay not to be okay. That is our strap line, but I think it's the heart of the gospel. It isn't that, come on church, you've got to try harder. It's that I absolutely, I couldn't love you anymore and I'll never love you any less. There's the gospel. Not that the God of the Old Testament didn't, but there was still this covenant you had to keep. And if you didn't keep it, it was like God, he just couldn't be, it, he's holy. And to have relationship with him, it was putting it right and putting it right and putting it right. Jesus comes, he dies on the cross, he rises again, he puts it right. We live in that. 
Isn't this great news? I, I, I don't think I'd ever understood it before I was ill. Because I'd been so busy trying to earn God's love, I hadn't realised I already had it. I'd been so busy trying to get everybody on board so we could change the world, I hadn't realised God was changing the world anyway. And it was my world he was starting with. There's something about seeing God clearly that is before we can see anything else. So in terms of see it first, see him. Who is, if somebody says to you, oh, you believe in God, who's that then? Where do you go with that? There's a huge interest in spirituality. There is a huge, I don't think people are turning away from God. When we've opened our prayer rooms, people are very keen to come and pray. The cafe owner who owns Tiffin, who was not a Christian, came and learnt the Lord's Prayer so she could come and pray with us. A little young man who, you know, lost his brother and, and autistic, 16 years old, came and prayed in our prayer room because he wanted to, because he found it helpful. He said, can I, can I, oh, I'm going to read it, yeah, I know you've, some of you have heard this before, but I love it. He said, Is it, I, I, I like those Psalms, Mrs. Rice, because I used to teach him. So I, I said, what, so what's that, uh, Tom? And he said, um, those in the middle of the Bible. And I went, oh yeah, you've got a Bible. Yeah, Gideon one. This is a young lad. Found his Gideon Bible in a moment of awful tragedy. And he said, but I've written one, is that okay? And in our prayer room, again, these spaces where we're saying to people, here is God, you can know him. We're not going to, you don't have to know all these rules. You can just come and talk to him. He wrote this, 16, not a Christian. When my friends are in need, you are mightier than their troubles. When I'm down in the dumps, you are mightier than my sorrows. When nothing goes as planned, you are mightier than the day. When I don't know what to say, you are mightier than words. Yet with your power, you cradle and nourish us. You help us all be mighty, Lord. I know, right? Are people wanting to pray? Yes. Are people wanting God? Yes. How are we, God's people, holding our relationship with him so openly, our habits with him so openly that people can join in? Just bringing our prayer rhythms into the life of our communities. Really, I think people are ready for that. I really do think we've got an open door right now, and it might not be open for a long time, but it, right now it is. What, is. what does well-being look like for you, God's people, and how will you share that relationship? If God's love is so beautiful in Jesus, and, and, and when, when people start talking about God, they go all kind of like, ooh, you know, like he's mysterious. We know that Jesus is the image of the, the, the visible image of the invisible God, don't we? We know that he looks like Jesus, and by the Holy Spirit of God in us, we get all that is Jesus's on us, and all that is ours goes on him. What? This is amazing. I, I don't know how it took me 50 years almost to come alive to the gospel, the simplicity and the beauty of it. It is what's lacking. But I, I can remember Rachel, our mental health professional, saying to me when we first set up Renew 37, why are your guys not talking about their faith? And I said, oh, we're not doing proselytizing in here. It's an, any faith and none, no proselytizing. And we don't, it's not evangelism. She said, I don't even know what you're talking about. She said, it's just your story, isn't it? Why can't you just be normal? Oh, well, we've, we've done a course about that. We don't know how to be normal. Um, and so little by little, the Renew Space taught us how to talk normally about God, not church, just, just our relationship with Jesus. Not with a funny voice on, because we think we might be doing evangelism now, and we've asked everybody to pray for us so we can say a thing. No, just normal. Just like genuinely overflowing cup. This is, I'm back to knowing, without him in my life, I, I, I actually can't get out of bed. I'm back to knowing that even if I don't get out of bed, he's okay with that. And that is such good news. In a world where people are feeling like a project and everybody wants to fix them, isn't it wonderful to know you're loved anyway? Is that where the church comes in? Do we know that? Or are we busy trying to fix everyone as well? from our place of brokenness? Is there something else that we're being called to? Oh, oh I've got to stick to the timetable. It's all right, Becky, I'm on it. I've written it on my hand, because I know I've <laughs> she's very, She's very organized. I do get a bit carried away. She knows that about me. So, so once you've seen him, and you know who he is, and how will you know? Read the Gospels. Read the Gospels every day, if you can. Read a Gospel, keep going through it. Get the Psalms into your being every day. Take time just to sit with a piece of worship music, let it wash over you. I don't know, what, what is your thing? Where are your habits? We'll talk about those in the next session. How do you hear from him? Secondly, you need to see yourself. 
Jeremiah, I really love because he obviously wasn't feeling very confident, neither was I. Now, it wasn't, I'm only young, because obviously I'm not. It was, I'm only a girl. I'm brought up in a brethren church. You do know I'm only a girl. Don't say I'm only a girl. You are a girl. <laughs> I chose you to be that. Bill Johnson says, if we knew who God had created us to be, we really wouldn't want to be anybody else. The full person of who God made you to be. That's who he wants you to be. And Jeremiah needed to hear, don't say that about yourself. I don't, that's kind of a word to you now. Don't put yourself down. Don't say I'm too old. Never too old. You've seen how old some of these guys were? Don't say I'm too this or too that or too in doubt or too in fear. Actually, you read the Bible, God seems to be okay but having a relationship with anybody. So there is no I'm too this. He's made you to be you and he wants to not use you. You're not a spatula. He wants to partner with you, co-produce with you, be in love with you. It's his marriage imagery. We, use, we, we, we speak very often over ourselves as church, some sort of service user thing going on. I, don't, I think one of the words I've learned from the mental health team is co-production. I really like it. It's where you come together alongside each other to make a, a, a service. It's not unto, it's, it's no them and us. And I think God co-produces with us. In Christ, he comes alongside us. He lives our life with us and we live his life with him in the very little things. We'll talk about that in the next session a bit more, some of the kind of contemplative practices that will help us with that. Let me tell you about the tree before it's too late, because <clears throat> that would be really funny if I brought it and then I didn't use it. Then you go, I remember I talking, there was a tree, but it seemed to have nothing to do with it. You see, he made only you. So if you can see him and you can see yourself, as he sees you, just for a moment, then you'll be able to see what he is seeing. If we just start looking for all the problems in the world and try starting to fix them, I have a feeling we might add to them. And maybe sometimes we have. If we start by going, so who is he? What is his love look like? And who am I? And where do I actually sit? So where do I sit? Where has he placed you? What can you see from where you're sitting? When I was ill, I saw a world I'd never seen before. And that was the world I then needed to do something about. I couldn't walk away from my friends I'd made during that time and, and pretend I'd never heard that the church wasn't quite meeting the, the thing. Where do you sit? See, the other thing that God showed me, here's where the tree comes in, where the other word of calling I had was from Judges chapter 4. Inflatable tree, judges, who knew? Connection. So, Judges chapter 4 talks about one of my heroes of the faith, Deborah. Um, and I was at a course with a lady called Kate Coleman, uh, some of you will know, and it was the seven deadly sins of women in leadership. And one of those sins of women in leadership is not a clear enough personal vision. And we're scattergunning our compassion and our love everywhere. Because, oh, we need to fix this one. Oh, and that one's wrong. Oh, and we must do this one. That was me. That's, why, that's how I got broken. So how could I see what God was seeing that matched with me, with who I am and what I can actually do something about? And, and then, and then I, I went to bed and she said, go and read about one of your heroes of faith. So I read about Deborah. And in Judges chapter 4, it describes this awful, awful situation that the nation had got into. And then it says, now Deborah, wife of Lapidoth, a prophetess in the time, was judging Israel. She used to sit under a tree that was between the house of God, Bethel, I'm keeping you on your toes with that, I bet you've lost me now. The house of God, Bethel, and Rama, the way place of weeping, and she would sit between them. And from there she could see, and she could judge, and she could make judgments, and she could see Baruch could go and fight this battle. And, and she, from that place, in the in-between place, and in that moment, God called me to sit in an in-between place between the church, because I could understand church, I can speak church, and the mental health system, and I, I'm beginning to speak mental health system, and somewhere in between was a tree to sit under, and it looked like a renewed space. And then he said to me, and I woke up with this in my head, now Ruth, wife of Mark, a missional leader, was planting renew centres in the land at that time. Like I woke up with that in my head, weird, right? Wrote it down, thought that must be important, I probably wouldn't have thought of that, and this is five years ago, what's a Renew Centre? Because actually I had no idea at that point, so the dream came first, and that was part of what God was doing. So I sat in the place of brokenness, and then I could see other people's brokenness. And then I also sat in the place of scripture where I could see myself through, wow, what else, what else has God ever done? <laughs> And then, who is he? Who am I? What can I see? 
then in all of that seeing, him seeing in, seeing out, there's a point where something might happen. I'm going to leave it at that point because we're going to pick up in the next session. But um, you have been placed uniquely, whether you're the leader of the church or part of the church, as a church you've been placed uniquely where you are and you can see something. I'm hoping you can see the mental ill health stuff around you. If you can't, look a bit closer, honestly. I, don't think, I think that's probably for me. I can't understand why everybody wouldn't want to get involved. This is so beautiful and everybody's got some vulnerable people in their church. But you might be seeing something else from where you're sitting. And you might be somebody who's just sitting in the pew going, oh, I don't know, I better not say it. Say it, honestly. Because he's probably showing the same thing to a few people if it's a church thing. Now, an individual thing. What if you're somebody in business? I've got a real heart to pray for business leaders, entrepreneurs, money makers. Don't be embarrassed about it. God's placed you there because the resources need to come into all this amazing kingdom work for pioneering and initiatives. And, and maybe you're somebody, and here's another group of people who's a carer. You care day in, day out for one person. And you'd love to be on that team or this team or doing that. And, and God's placed you with that one person to care for them. Some of you will know the work of Henry Nowen. Um, Henry Nowen learnt most of what he learnt caring for one person who had no communication at all. And he learnt what it looks like to be in the presence of Jesus through being with that person. Is that your calling? Is that what you see? Are you a prayer? Are you a prayer warrior? I wouldn't do what I could do without Yvonne. Yvonne is uh, part of our church, uh, but she doesn't come to church because of her ill health, her heart failure. Um, and Yvonne prays for me every single day. And I pray with her every single week, I've done for years. And without Yvonne, she goes, oh, I wish I could do this. I wish I could go to church. I wish I could. And I'm going, Yvonne, you have been placed here. And, and she's got a touch of Alzheimer's now. And she goes, I can't remember what you said. And I said, that's why it's safe for me to tell you anything. So you're great. <laughs> And, and she, she loves that. She loves that. She loves that actually the very things that she sees as an awful thing make her my partner in crime in this whole thing, you know. There are, there are things you are called to. Henry Nowen um, says, you don't think your way into a new kind of living. You live your way into a new kind of thinking. We're going to think more about that next session. And I just want to pray for you. And then I'm going to hand over to Mike so we can have a bit of thinking together in groups. Father, thank you for this group of people. Thank you for the trees under which these guys are sitting, the places that, that, that you've placed them, the home situations, the neighbourhoods, the workplaces. Thank you for, for those who are sitting calmly and have time to see things. Thank you that if the best thing we do is to pray, then that's all we can do. It's a promotion. Thank you, Lord, that you have called some of us to be still a lot. And thank you that for others, you've called them to see one thing, to tell others and to do something about it. So help us during this day, Lord. Help us discern just that thing. But first, Lord, I just pray over this group of people that they would see you and see you smiling down on them and see you saying, my children, I love you. My little flock, I love you. I give my life for you. I couldn't love you any more and I'll never love you any less, even if you never left the building. And Lord then, would you show us who we are so we can be fully ourselves, so we can fully live in the skin we're in, fully be complete in the things that you've called us to do and be, the things that you've designed for us. Can we join in with that, Lord, in a, in a wholesome and joyful way? rather than a, a dutiful way. Lord, show us what you're seeing out there. Show us what you're seeing around us. Show us how you see the world. Help us see it your way. In Jesus' name, amen. We love you, Lord. Thank you that you love us more. <laughs> so come and uh, help us now to hear you. Help us to see you, to see you in all your glory, to see you, to see ourselves as you see us, to see the world as you see it. Now help us to hear you and hear what you're saying.
one of our habits of prayer, and I'll do it now because it's lunchtime, is uh, using the Lord's Prayer. So you don't need anything in your hands, you just need yourself. You just sit calm and quiet. And in our prayer rooms all over the country, people stop at 12 or middle of their session, sit quietly, take a few deep breaths. Remember the chair that you're sitting on is holding you up, not you. That's God's arms holding you. The meditation, he anoints us with the oil of gladness. If your mind wanders off, just bring it back and just say those words. Lord, anoint me with the oil of gladness. Our Father in heaven, honoured be your name. So think of his name now. And either quietly or out loud, one after another, let's remind each other of his name. The Prince of Peace. Feel free to say his name out loud, one after another, whatever you're thinking of. The Lamb of God. Thank you, Lord. Emmanuel. Bless you, Lord. Mm. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That, that's a big, big request, right? On earth as it is in heaven. So let's speak out just word, just one word or sentence again, the names of places and situations where we'd love to see his kingdom come. Not in Syria today. Mm. Pakistan. Mm. Yes, Lord, may your kingdom come. Yeah. Mm. Right here in Mansfield. May your kingdom come. May your will be done. Give us this day our daily bread. So it's okay to ask him. We normally start by thanking him for actual bread, things that you're thankful for. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. And then ask him for what you need. He's a good father. Remembering Jesus is the bread of life and he is enough for us. Lord, Jesus. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. It normally goes quiet at this point. <laughs> but go for your life if it's helpful, but... Uh, Normally we spend a few minutes each day just confessing any sin and choosing to try and forgive others, including ourselves. Thank you, Lord, for your forgiveness. Lead us not into temptation. You know what that is for each of us, for our churches and our situations. Lead us the other way, Lord. Lead us the other way. Lead us into life. And deliver us from evil. At this time of the day, we always pray for uh, the persecuted church, because there is only one church, and that church is persecuted. So we remember brothers and sisters who can't possibly meet like this in the middle of the day for fear. So let's just pray again, just a sentence or a word or quietly in your head for anywhere where people aren't free, where evil is at the door. Jesus. Lord, in Pakistan again, Jesus. In Eritrea, Lord, keep bringing freedom. For North Korea. Jesus. And we're so thankful, Lord, for our freedom. But we, we sit here in solidarity with your church. 
Deliver them from evil. Deliver us from evil. Where the darkness comes from inside out, we pray for everyone who hasn't yet been able to get out of bed this morning, who's found it really hard today. Bring them hope this day, we pray. Make us hope bringers. And we use the blessing in the middle of the day from Faldi Brennan, which is a retreat centre in Pembrokeshire. And they say, keep us in the beautiful attitudes, joyful, simple, and gentle. And may the favour of the Lord our God be upon us. Establish for us the work of our hands, O Lord. Establish the work of our hands. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Amen. So that's lunchtime prayer, and that's happening pretty much everywhere. I nearly did that thing. I was speaking at a church down in Battle the other day, and when I'm, I talk and I wander, you've noticed that, I do the same when I'm praying. Anyway, I was praying and talking, and I ended up sitting on this guy's <laughs> knee, like a really elderly bloke in the front, and I was praying at the same time, and I thought, well, do I draw attention to this, or do I just get off and carry on? So I just... I just got up and carried on and went, and he kept his eyes shut. It was like, I don't know whether he thought it was the Holy Spirit. Who thought it was like, I was like, so I just kind of learned not to trip, really, but there you go. Um, so you might notice you've got a little gift uh, on your chair. Some of you have and some of you haven't. I almost don't draw attention to it because I was a primary school teacher for 20 years, and I know I've lost you all now already because you're all looking for it, picking it up. You, um, the wonderful Becky... When I suggested this idea, then there's been scouring, making sure there's enough mugs for you to have one each. And these pens, which you might have to share, are either right for all Sharpies, which will wash off eventually in your dishwasher, or these amazing things, which you might want to share, acrylic painters, which will never come off. And I want to invite you in a minute, so don't um, worry if you haven't got one now, you might have to share. We, if you haven't got a mug, don't worry, we'll find you one. Don't write on the ones that belong to this church. <laughs> Seriously, right? Uh, these are from... Oh, they don't say. They're cheap, anyway. Um, so don't write on the, on the expensive ones, right? That's all I need to say to you. Because we've come, we're coming to the section that's about hearing it. How do you hear it? And I'm, I'm glad it, it's kind of working well. It's like, it's like there's a God, right? Because in that group over there, which I thought was a reflection group, but ended up being discussion because that's what Mike had announced, we discussed a little bit about how you know if it's a God idea or just a good idea. How do you, what's the wisdom behind that? How do you, how do you hear him? So first, how, how do you hear God? What, what does that look like for you to hear God speak to you? Because we use an awful lot of language in church that makes us think like there's some people who are hearing like this direct voice from God. My story about this tree will have been helpful to some and really unhelpful to others who have never had a dream like that and they think that's the only way God calls them. God's speaking to us all the time. That the frequency of heaven is all around us. That stilling ourselves, like we did just now, is about us tuning in again, placing ourselves again. I sometimes take my cup uh, during this point of a, a talk, and, and it's sort of, you know, the empty cup. And I, I plunge it, I have a jug of water, and I'm going, I'm trying to fill myself up with these little habits of staying in God's presence. But actually, then, the best thing to do is to take your cup and plunge it into the presence of God and try and stay there. Because he is all around us. We don't need to invite him to join us, beg him to be with us. He is, this is his world. We, we are with him in it. And, and being aware of his presence, um, I think it was Frank Loback who said, wasn't it, back at the beginning of the, the last century, um, I want to make my life a practice of the presence of God. He was quoting on the whole Brother Lawrence stuff from back in the 17th century, you know, where Brother Lawrence would do the dishes with Jesus and, and be, you know, boiling the kettle with Jesus and the ordinary things, the little things. It's, it's something, isn't it, to hear the big call of God to do a set up a charity. But that only happens about, about the little things, the tiny things, the moments where we go, this day, this day's your day. I think for me, having made myself quite poorly, trying to do God's job for him, realising that if I want to join in with him, I have to listen better for where he is. I, for many of us, hearing becomes a problem, doesn't it, as we get older. And, and it is a problem. And actually, seriously, around mental and emotional health, it's really difficult for people with hearing loss it's very, it's very lonely, it's very isolating. Set up your spaces in a way where the calm and the quiet is good for people 
for whom hearing is an issue. It, it, it's a real issue. Um, but one of the things about us hearing God is we sometimes don't know what he sounds like and what we sound like or what the church sounds like. Or Is that just some minister? Was that just Ruth wanting us to set up a renewed centre? Yes, it was. No, it wasn't. It was God. Um, so what, how do we know what he sounds like? So John 10, my sheep know my voice. My sheep know my voice. Do you know what his voice sounds like? How will you train your ear to hear him? How are you going to train your heart? What are your daily habits of tuning into the voice of God who is always around us, breathing his love through everything in the universe? So I bring you the habit of the, the cup today, which I'm going to teach you and then let you have a go at. But it's only my habit that I'm sharing with you. You will have your own habits that I would love over lunch for you to share with each other. What normally happens at these Christian events, and I have been to so many, is you go, are we, are we, are we on stage or off stage now? Right, off stage life conversations, we can't be talking about that. That's a little bit too spiritual. Please have the conversations that are helpful to you all the time, not just when it's organised for you to have them. So if over the, the dinner table you really wanted to say to somebody, do you have any habits you could share with me? Because I'd, I'd really love to know what they are. Let, let's associate today at the deepest level of our relationship with God, shall we? Shall we share the depths of the things we normally keep secret? Because I know that the Bible tells us to keep those habits secret, but actually right now in our nation, People are crying out to know what we mean when we say God speaks to us and, and we pray. They are, seriously. And, and it's time for us to get, like, just be normal about it. When we say we pray about something and it helps our well-being, what do we mean? And so that's what we're doing in our renewed spaces. Is we're trying to unravel that a little bit and make it simple enough for anybody to join in. So um, one of my habits is, uh, of listening to God is around taking my cup. I, I think this is because if you look at John 10... Just um, before we get to this, if you look at John 10, and the images in John 10 are all around the Good Shepherd, which, I mean, my, my psalm of my life, really, is, is Psalm 23. You know, he, he is my shepherd. I, I shall not want. I shall not be empty. I shall not be in lack. Because he's my shepherd. It's great. It's a great psalm, isn't it? For all sorts of reasons, not just good for funerals. And um, this Good Shepherd image is quite a helpful way for us to think about how, we, how do we know it's God? How do we know this is the voice of Jesus? How are we going to hear that? Because there's so many other voices. So the imagery around shepherd, um, it seems to suggest in the first bit, it says in the first bit, um, verse 2, 3, uh, I say to you, da -la, da -la, da -la, yeah, he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him, the gatekeeper opens. So the image here was, if you were... Um, if you were going to leave your sheep overnight you would, and you were traveling, you would put your sheep in a pen and then you would have a, a, a gatekeeper who would look after them and then you would come to collect them and you would call your sheep and your sheep would come to you. That's the kind of image Jesus was drawing on and it would be a normal image for them. It's not normal for us because we don't know shepherd talk. But when I thought about that, I thought, oh. So, our minds are constantly open to all sorts of stuff, aren't they? And how are we going to hear when it's the shepherd's voice? How are we going to open? The gatekeeper will open to the shepherd's voice. So it's about choosing what we open our minds to. So I said earlier on, I'm a constant worrier. I get a choice. Every thought that goes through my head, and boy, there's a lot of them. I said to my husband the other day when we woke up, I went, what are you thinking about? And he went, nothing. I've just woken up. <laughs> I went, I'm always thinking about something, always. So in here, it's like, blah, 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 blah. And so choosing, choosing what to think about, is a, we can choose that. Sometimes when you are clinically unwell, please don't hear me wrong, that is a clinical condition. You need medication, you need treatment, you need some help, and it's very hard, and you will not hear maybe for quite a while. People around you need to love you back to health like they would do if it was any other condition, physical or mental. However, for a lot of us, the anxiety that runs through our veins is part of being human, right? And not all of us, because many of you are going, no, I'm never anxious. I have never had a worried moment in my life. I must tell you, many prayer meetings I've been to are just worrying with your eyes shut. And I think <laughs> if prayer becomes that, I was at, I was at a centre yesterday and it was this beautiful 
beautiful Renew Centre they're setting up in a, um, in a garden centre in Worcester, which used to be a horticulture project for, uh, for therapy for people with mental health issues, and the NHS shut it. And then a friend sort of started opening it up again. Anyway, long story short, these two guys come into the prayer shed, because we had a shed for prayer, and they sat themselves down, and they had been using services for a long time, and they'd also dipped into church. So when they knew it was a prayer place, they sat down with a great big list of things they needed to pray about. And there were all worries and concerns. And he went, will you pray for me for this? Will you pray for this for me? Will you pray for me for this? And I went, yeah, we, we will pray about those, but this is how we do prayer. So first, let's settle ourselves into the fact that God is God and we are not. And it was really interesting that at the end of it, this guy went, oh, that's the happiest I've felt for many a long year. And it was just this, actually, we've made prayer into part of the problem if we're not careful. It's like the way in which we come on, let's storm the gates of hell. And I'm not saying we shouldn't storm the gates of hell, but have we lost something of the quiet, still, beautiful presence of God who invites us to join in with him? So here is one of my habits of hearing the voice of God. Because as we open our door of our mind to him and our heart to him, because the, the mind is the gateway to the soul, as we open our mind to him and only to him, he has already opened his door to us. I love that Eugene Peterson translation of Romans 5, don't you? It says, um, we fling open our doors to him to find he has already flung open his door to us. And we find ourselves standing where we always hoped we might in the wide open spaces of his grace. <laughs> How good's that? I mean, it doesn't say that actually in Romans 5, but Eugene, <laughs> love the man. Absolutely love it. And I love the image. There's like a double door. You get to choose what you think about. And when you throw open the door. Sarah uh, for Grado was here said earlier, when you get involved in the mental health thing and you think you've pushed a little door, then inside there's another door wide open with a red carpet going, come on, I've been waiting for you. That is exactly the image that we have here of God's presence. So getting your habits, your brother Lawrence habits, your Frank Loback habits. This one comes from a lady called Joyce Rupp, who's written a book called The Cup of Our Life which uh, I've done mostly with groups of ladies. And the reason why I've mostly done this with groups of ladies is because once I said in a mixed group, pick your favourite cup. And this guy looked at me and he went, favourite cup? Like, it's not a thing. I went, okay, just me then. Anyway, we've given you all the same cup, but they won't be the same by the time we've finished. What your, your cup in Joyce Rupp speak, Joyce Rupp takes you a six-week course in the inner habits of prayer. If you're interested in it, Get the book off Amazon, share it with some friends. It was the start of my journey. And, and, and it's breath prayer and it's centering prayer and it's lecture divina and some of the things you'll know about and some you won't. And this one is, your, your life was like a cup in God's hands. Sometimes broken, sometimes dirty on the inside, always held by him. So as you hold your cup, you're imaging already God holding you. And, and I always, when I get to the bottom of my cup, that's when my kind of prayer starts, when it's empty. I start my day empty, just, Lord, like this. And um, I think it's a good image for me, because there's a lot of times in the day when I pick up a cup. It might just be me, but I do drink a lot of coffee and tea. And, and if you also have something, an object you can attach this practice to. As nonconformists, we did throw the baby out somewhat with the bathwater, didn't we, when it came to imagery and stuff, because it can be quite helpful to have something that you see every moment that reminds you that God's got you. Um, so uh, this cup here, uh, I'm going to ask you on your cup to just dig into the Psalms for the next ten, five or ten minutes. And what I'd like you to do, and if you haven't got a, a Bible with you, this is a church, right? There's bound to be a few knocking around. I'd like you to take five minutes, think of something that is always good and true for you. A psalm that you love, something that you have heard God speak over you. Because if we're ever going to hear what he says about someone else, we first need to hear what he says about us. It's no good us hearing that the world is a broken place and full of evil if we haven't heard the beautiful whisper of his love for us. So I'm going to ask you to think of, I've put on the bottom of this, if you didn't like messing with something like this, if this is really, on, if this is really out of character for you, tough. You don't ever have to do it again. But this is, I've just written on this, be still and know that he is God.
because that's my kind of lunch time. Be still and know that he'd be actually still, bodily still. And I probably would write round here the whole of Psalm 23 if I had time. If you haven't got time to write the whole psalm around it because you can't get hold of a pen, spend some time looking at the psalms and reminding yourself that there might be something in there that has been really important to you at some point in your life. Particularly the psalms. I say particularly the psalms because they are so important in the centre of the Bible in that they are this wonderful poetic language. We're almost like we're let in on somebody else's relationship with God, right? And it's okay not to be okay pretty much all the time with the Psalms. So if you can re-engage with a Psalm from your youth, or if you've never looked at the Psalms, here's a first, don't try and read them all, it's 150. Um, but if you start at the beginning and you just get stuck with one, you could do much worse than that. Psalm 1's a good one. Um, and if you get really stuck and you've no idea where to go with this because you're not familiar with your Bible yet, 23, just read it and see where you get to with that. Once you pick something out, if you're very arty, Draw all over your cup. If you're not at all, just hold your cup and take some moments of quiet and reflect. That's also fine. If you haven't got a cup, come and see Becky at the front here and she will get you a cup. If you haven't got a pen, then you'll have to share them down the row. But we're literally going to five or ten minutes because you'll take this away with you after we've done something symbolic with it. You'll take this away with you and it will remind you to be still daily hourly, minutely, okay? So find psalm, write a little bit on your cup, make this cup something that will be helpful for your ongoing relationship with God. So the reason why we know that as we spend time with him, we are going to hear his voice eventually, is because of what happens next in John 10, where he says, I am the door. Here's the two doors. Because the other image that Jesus would be bringing is when you put your own sheep in the pen, the shepherd would lie across the doorway to keep them safe. There's two images there. Beautiful. He is the door. You're not looking for a doorway in. You're not trying to persuade him to talk to you. You're not trying to persuade him to tell you his heart. He is your door. He's the doorway in. He, he's, he's, he's there. He's opened his door to you already at the cross. So just practically speaking, you'll know his voice through scripture. First and foremost, if you don't have a habit with this, get a habit with this. The Psalms, the Gospels, right the way through it. But actually, it's beautiful. You'll meet him in here. If you're struggling with the Bible, it's all got a bit dry. Just pick a Gospel you have loved before. But John's Gospel. If you don't know where else to go back to, go back to John's Gospel. Read it until you meet Jesus again in it. Um, you will hear him speak through other people. Definitely. And you will hear him speak through any myriad of tiny things that happen. How will you know what he's saying about out there? Well, once you know it's not an out there, that's when you know it's him. So <laughs> what I'm trying to say is, I don't think there is an out there and an in here. Because I don't recognise the church as a building. I don't think you do either. I don't think it's the church and the community. I think it is those that God loved that he came and gave his life for. And we are the community. We're part of the community. So when we begin to listen to people's stories, when we find the places to sit at table with people and, 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 and listen, that's where the cafes help. But you'll have your own example of that. When you listen to someone else's story, when you listen to someone else's day, whether they're working in mental health services or whether they're working in the local shop, when you ask them a question and listen for the answer, you'll probably hear God speak. Sometimes you will hear God speak. In the most unusual places, he will show up. He, because he's already there. And when he sent us out, he sent us out to find the people of peace and stay with them. Luke 10. There are people of peace all over the place. And if we ask each other questions and we listen for stories and at the bus stop or whatever, on the bus, when you're at work, just the right question dropped in that you've asked God to give you, suddenly God is speaking. Bonhoeffer, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, um, theologian from, it was, uh, in, in third, in the, he was in Germany during the Third Reich and, and his life was given up to uh, trying to see something happen around that. And his writing is fascinating and he wrote in a little book called Life Together that we mustn't make ourselves the, the, the creators of community because we're not. Only God is. He's already made community. We just get to join in with it. 
Otherwise, we become irritated with people when they don't do what we'd like them to do. And he also said, don't approach another person directly except through the lens of Christ. So that's fascinating, right? If we've got another person and we try and help them or we try and get them to help us, we can get a dependency going on that is unhelpful. It's not that we don't help other people, it's through Christ. This is, Lord, you take this and you use this for this person's life. And actually, if that person then says something horrible back to me, I'm going to let that go through the lens of Christ. I'm going to let that go through the power of Christ. It'll help those of you in leadership to stay in leadership a long time. Because actually, if he is what is around you and through him, uh, we don't lean on anyone else. We lean on him. And uh, just it's, it's a fascinating concept that will help us if we're going to hear what God's saying. He will translate for us. Jesus will be around us translating what we're hearing into something that we actually cope with. So I hope that's helpful to you in your what are you hearing? What are you hearing him say to you? If you haven't got any habits of just sitting still and listening, try and get one, even if it's just for a minute. Literally set a timer for a minute. I'm not being funny here, because you can kid yourself that you've sat still and listened to God, and it's been like 30 seconds, and then you're back into your busy... Now, before I got ill, I definitely was reading the Bible and praying, but it was part of what made me ill, because I was doing it in such a way that if I didn't do it, I felt guilty, and, and there was, oh, I haven't done a quiet time, and wasn't long enough, and I didn't pray for enough people... So if you've got, not got a habit of just stilling all of that, sitting quiet and still, I dare you to try it and set a timer for a minute and do it every day until you can set a timer for two minutes, until you can sit longer with him than you can rush around doing his work for him. I think something might happen as you listen to him. And listening to his world, well, listen, ask questions, talk, find out what people are saying. Be careful how you hear it. Let him interpret it to you. Lord, I pray that as we hear, you give us your ears to hear what you're hearing. It's quite a dangerous prayer when I asked him to do this for me. I cannot now not hear the cry of despair and isolation behind closed doors whenever I pray up and down our streets. So he may actually let you in on what he's hearing. And then there will be some response. When we say break our hearts with what breaks yours, Lord, I don't think we always mean it. But if you could whisper to us how much you love us and how you've got us and how it's okay for us not to be okay, then maybe we could hear what you can hear and work out how we can join you in what you're doing about it. Thank you, Father, for time to listen. Help us find habits of listening. In Jesus' name, Amen.
I'm not a saint, I'm more of a sinner. I don't want to lose, but I fear for the winners. Everyone needs to pray. I mean, that's... I'm not in, ch- I'm not in church, not reading my Bible, but I... I'm still here and I'm still your disciple. It's weird, isn't it? I, I, this is Sam Smith. So, um, if you want to join in this experiment and adventure, please um, do come and have a chat with us. Sarah, where are you, Sarah? For grade O's, Sarah, just come and join in a minute. Sarah, um, Sarah's leading a centre in Leicestershire, and we've got a bit of good news if you live in Leicestershire and you want to join in. Tell them a, tell them a, a minute about what's happening in Leicestershire, Sarah. Well, you're going to have that on there, or you'll have to stand at it. You'll have to get up on the step, yeah. So, uh, we wanted, I wanted to start a renew centre at uh, Hugglescote Community Church, just south of Colville. And uh, I took very seriously what Ruth said about um, being in partnership. And so I made contact with someone from the council, and I met with them <coughs> about uh, July last year, so 2017, and they uh, were thrilled. I, I was a bit, because uh, I'd been to Ruth's presentation and I just regurgitated Ruth's presentation and I knew a few things, but I just used the right words. And they said, will you come and train us at County Hall in co-production? <laughs> <laughs> but these two women that I met, Donna and Sabrina, and Sabrina is actually a Muslim, um, they got it. They were my people of peace and they have been my champions and our champions and the champions of Renew within Leicestershire County Council. And we have met, we've gone back and forth. We, uh, like Ellen said, we have a ministry of cake and they come back and forth because the cake is good. And uh, this has culminated over this summer that, that Donna and Ruth have gone, uh, Donna and Sabrina have gone back into County Hall into the community's teams and have said to them, this is something that is being done in our community uh, by a church that is worth us backing and supporting and we want you to hear about it. So they invited us to come to uh, various meetings at County Hall, uh, culminating in the Senior Managers Conference, which is the directors and assistant directors of Leicestershire County Council get together periodically and we were renew was one of the uh, seminars that they were invited to because people wanted to know about renew and on the back of that I had a meeting uh, at the cafe in Hugglescote and uh, Donna brought to me people that she thought could resource me um, so various different council initiatives from the county council and the district council who want to support us who are saying we will come we'll bring this resource we'll connect you into that resource and I, I was saying to Ruth earlier, it's like God has just gone, not only is the door open, but here is the red carpet. This is where I, this is what I am doing, what I was working on in Leicestershire before you got here. Yeah. And uh, they said to me, uh, well, I'll pause that story. Breakfast with Bishop Martin in the middle of Colville, a whole load of church leaders. And I talked about Renew, and he came to me afterwards and said, I want to send someone to you. I want this to be on my agenda for Leicester Diocese. So Ruth and I are meeting with someone from the diocese about putting these two groups together uh, to, to have something happening in Leicester that we don't know what in Leicestershire, which is involving Leicester Diocese, Leicestershire County Council, and two Baptists. And with a view to having more Renew centres, and the county council are saying, we will resource you. Uh, with all the resources that we're offering you, Sarah, we can offer to other Renew Centres, and the Bishop and his team are saying, what can we do to get Church of England on board? And then my latest thing, uh, or my thing that has always been a thing, is, is about young people. Mm. And uh, I think Renew could work with young people as well. And so I've had in my head that we do Renew, and then we think about Renew Youth. And... Uh, because my background is in youth work. And last week I had a lady walk in to Renew and she said, can I talk to you? Uh, she works for social services as a carer. Um, she said, but she wants to do some youth work voluntarily. She saw the film. There's a film that I made with one of our uh, visitors who comes to Renew about uh, me talking about what Renew is, him talking about how good it's been for him. And she'd seen that at County Hall. So it's all over County Hall, this mm. video is just going on and on. And uh, she wants to come and help me with a Renew Youth thing. So I told my, my district council contact about this 
uh, yesterday, and she said, well, that's very funny. We're doing time bank in Leicestershire County Council, and I'm going to talk to a man on Monday who works for the youth offending team. He wants to do some voluntary work with young people somewhere. I'll send him to you. Do you ever get the feeling God's going, come on, come on, get on with it, Sarah? And I'm just sitting there going, no, Lord, please. But this, I, this is what God is doing with Renew. So if you're in Leicestershire, obviously... Ruth is the queen of all things Renew, but if you're in Leicestershire, in Leicestershire now, yeah. <laughs> and if you want to come and talk about what about Renew, if you want to come and see Renew in action in Hugglescote, which is near Colville, or you want to know about how the county council, we have an open door into the county council right now who are offering support. They are senior managers telling their social work team managers, send someone along once a month to this because we need to be supporting this. Brilliant. Thanks, Sarah. Great, isn't it? Thanks, mate. Yeah, it's good. Yeah, thank you. So, um, and uh, Sarah is what we call a well-being local link, a welly for short, and uh, there are six, six so far, and that is what's happening now, is the, the, the thing, the network is expanding, and we're working out how to spread this without losing the simplicity of it, so I really, if nothing else, I covet your prayers, please. No idea a year ago that this would all be happening. The numbers just relate to the number on the road. But if you look at the number in, in the Psalms, it's always something great. So it's been quite fun and God's joined in with the fun of it. We did have a, we got a 169 going on in Toaster. And uh, she went, there aren't 169 Psalms though. And I went, what's 16 verse 9? Oh, it's a good one. Oh, it's all good. We have got an 88. If you look at Psalm 88, it's a little bit depressing. But hey, it does describe <laughs> mental health. Um, so just coming into land here. Partnership is really, really key. Who are you partnering with also? So if we're going to live it, if we're going to live out what we're going to do, we're not going to do it on our own. God is already up to something. We're going to join in. If nothing else, please hear there's an open door within the area of mental and emotional well-being and a tried and tested way. And we are co-producing a charity as we move forward to see how we can do it better and learning across. Let's associate properly. Hey, This is an association day. Let's learn from each other. One of the most delightful things I am seeing is churches working together on this in a way I've never seen before. I trained a team in the Isle of Man. My little brethren church, the Catholic church and the charismatic Baptist church are running a centre together. I trained my mum to be a host. My mum who fixes everybody before they can move, before they can breathe, is now sitting knitting peacefully and saying, this is the best thing I've ever done. Non-Christians are quite nice, aren't they? We've not really met any before. So... Where are the places where you're listening? Where are the places where you're hearing? If you haven't got another one, why not have one of these? I have a dream, a vision for a, a network of these spaces all over the place, which will help us stay well ourselves if we attend to our own well-being whilst all these other amazing things are happening around us. Why are we doing all of this? Why are we partnering? Because we have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son of the Father, full of grace and truth, right? He came to be incarnate among us, so we now, his body, are incarnate in the places where he's put us. We know that stuff, but what does it actually look like? It's a time, it's a season, it's an open door. I have never known a time like this, and I've been in this area working for 30 years. I have never known a time like it for an open door to work with the council, with mental health services. The door is wide open. There is not the same sort of uh, suspicion of us as church because they're up to here. It's time to join in alongside and to learn ways to do this without being manipulative or pushy. They're just saying we also are human. Partnering is really important. Partner with each other across this association. Wouldn't it be amazing? And this is why I've done this. This is you, all with your individual little understandings of God's call on your life. But together, the light of Christ over the, all of you, filling all of you with the same light, that light bouncing out into this area. What would it look like if East Midlands Baptist Association became known for being the, the, the association that changed a region because we actually associated. It's been too long, hasn't it, where we've had this sin of independence and then we've tried to associate across independence. It feels to me like this area of mental ill health and prayer, we can get together on this because no one wants to be the experts in this stuff, believe me. No one wants to say, yes, we're the best at mental health. No, no one wants to get inundated so they don't do it. So we are prepared to work together. It's a gift to us as churches. Together across our Baptist churches and across networks. We have quite a lot of networks of churches working together. Who are you associating with? Who are you partnering with? 
And why are we doing that? Well, let me just take you to Luke 10 and 11 as we come into land. I, I'm loving these two chapters because we're only going to follow Jesus out of here, aren't we? We're just going to find where Jesus is going and we're just going to follow him. What does that look like? Well, it looks like Luke 10 and 11. So these, these disciples in, jo- in, in, um, in Luke, um, amazingly, they, they sort of... <laughs> They've gone out, the 72 in Luke 10, and they've done the stuff. They've found the people of peace. They've been with them. They've seen people healed and set free, and they're doing all that stuff. And they go, right, that's what Jesus wants us to do. We're going to follow Jesus out, and we're going to do the stuff. We're going to live the life. We're going to go out empty-handed. Hear that, though. You know, Jesus, the woman at the well, he goes through Samaria. He didn't have to go through Samaria. He chose to go through Samaria for that woman. Where's your Samaria? Sits at the well doesn't say, I'm going to give you some living water. He says, could I have a drink, please? I'm really thirsty and tired. Can you go to people empty? Can you, dare you, take your empty cup and work alongside other people? Go and find the people. Go without anything. Let them serve you. Be with them. So we've got a mandate to do that. We've got a mandate to find where God is working and go and work with him. Then he uh, he tells them the story of the Good Samaritan. So I love putting myself in the disciples' shoes, don't you, and going... Right, got it, Lord. We're going to go out. We're going to change the world. We'll take nothing with us. And then we'll, we'll see the people of peace. And then he, he tells the story of the Good Samaritan. And so they go, right. And we're also, social action is really important. We are going to feed the hungry. We're going to look after people. We're going, to, we're going to see need and we're going to meet it. That's important too, right? So you've got it. Don't stop there. Then he goes to Mary and Martha's house. And blows their minds again, like he does with us all the time. They think they've understood. Come on, let's do it. See it, say it, sort it. No, let's see it, let's hear it, let's live it the way Jesus lives it. So he sits down and Mary sits at his feet. And Martha runs ragged, serving them and tells her sister off. And at the end of Luke 10, he says, Martha, Martha. You are anxious and troubled about many things, but one thing is necessary, and Mary has chosen the good portion. That's irritating, right? You've just understood that you're going to change the world and make it all different, and you're going to be the best social action. The church is the answer to everything that's happening. And then Jesus says one thing, and it isn't rushing around, and it isn't being anxious, and it isn't being busy, and it is sitting at Jesus' feet. Hang on. And so when you get into Luke 11... And the disciples go with Jesus to a certain place where he's praying again, because that's how he leads them, by doing it. He leads them, he prays, they're with him, they see him praying. It's what people want to do with us, they want to come and see how we live. And then they got it, I think they get it. Because instead of saying, Lord, teach us to raise the dead. Oh, teach us to do that thing you do with the bread and the fish, that'd be good. Lord, teach us to pray. They've understood I think, the heartbeat of Jesus, his connection to his father. And if he needed to take time being God to go and pray, to be still, to be quiet with the father, how much more do we need to? And how have we managed to make ourselves into the fourth emergency service without prayer being at the heart of it? How? Jesus did three years of ministry and spent a good proportion of that quietly in prayer not busily trying to change everybody. The, 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 the actions of Jesus came out of the stillness of Jesus. We cannot do otherwise. And we will not do anyone any services, particularly not the church. We will become yet another service user type community that lets people down. We're not that. We're the people of God. We're called into the presence of God. Lord, teach us to pray. It's still my heartbeat that he would teach us to pray first and foremost, that we would be a people of prayer. If I tell you that when I go to talk to churches who invite me to come and talk about how to set up a new space, the one thing that means they don't do it is not working with mental health services, it's not setting up a cafe, it's not the being present or being in partnership, it's the prayerful habits. I went to a church, I won't, I won't tell stories of churches I've been to because you might know who they are, But there are some churches who are running shed loads of amazing social action. But if you ask them where their prayer space is, they haven't got one. And every space in the church building is taken up with some sort of service to somebody, which is still the gospel. But if we haven't put aside place to pray, we are not showing people what it looks like to live in well-being. 
talked earlier with the gentleman and said, my definition of well-being is now, the cup is half empty and the cup is half full, and that's the cup. It's held in God's hands, and to accept the cup has got joy and sorrow in it, and God holds that. that that's my best definition so far. I think if we don't help people to learn that, there's always going to be sharp edge services where we try and fix people, but we've got to go up river and find out why they're falling in. I, I think people are falling in for want of knowing they are held in the grip of grace by a God who's going to be okay even if we're not, who loves us anyway, has loved us from before the beginning of time and always will. Some of us We'll see amazing miracles happen and people will become well and fixed and housed and clothed and at the end of it all, some won't. Do you know what? He loves us with an everlasting love from beginning to end. We are held in the grip of grace. And sometimes it's great and sometimes it's awful. And God is still good. Our prayer lives cannot become fear-led, fear-dominated, that if God doesn't do some stuff in amongst us, he's not good anymore. He is still good. And out of his goodness, he also does amazing stuff, miracles, change in people's lives. But surely we've got a slightly different gospel than the one that says, come and we'll fix you. Come along and then you will be okay again. Come and have these, this, and I, I believe in all these things, CBT, therapy, medication. You need all those things if you are clinically unwell. But as well as that, what about your soul? We know this. Our bodies, our minds, they're important, they're the, but the, the soul of us, we, we bring that church, we bring that to the well-being conversation. We, yes, we can join in with all the other wonderful social action, do it, but don't forget you're distinctive. You're the people of God, the people of prayer. We can say to people, I don't know, I sit sometimes in a renewed space, somebody tells me their story, I don't know, I'm so sorry, I can't, I don't know. I'm so sorry that's happening to you, I'm going to go and pray. You're welcome to sit with me. I'm not going to pray for you, lay hands on you, offer you things that may or may not happen. I'm going to pray quietly like I always do, and I'm going to show you how I do it, and then that might help you. A friend of mine who was a, a, um, a lifeguard said, if you go to a drowning person, take something that floats, or they'll pull you under. My something that floats are my habits of meditation on the Psalms and my habits of prayer throughout the day. What's yours? Church, it's It's time. There's open door for us to join in. Live in well-being. Find out what that looks like for you. See it. See, see yourselves as God sees you. Sit quietly in that and know that the world still spins on its axis if you don't make it. Know that every day. Then hear what he's saying. Then live it. And if it all gets too much in the living of it, dial it back. Every day. Sit still again. Know that the world still spins on its axis. See that he is God. Hear that he loves you. Then live it. Let's get this rhythm of grace into our lives, folks. Because if we don't, who's going, to, who's going to answer Sam Smith's cry? Let me pray for you um, and us. Because this represents us, a uh, Baptist family across the East Midlands. And all the things that God has said to you today... The being prayerful and, and, and present and in partnership, the, the seeing it, the hearing it, the living it. It can all get, feel a bit much as you walk away from here, but I just want you to hear that one thing is necessary. And just take a deep breath and look at the table or close your eyes and ask him for the one thing today. Lord, would you please be gracious to us because we are fragile and vulnerable and human and we're full of compassion for our communities and we do want to be your church, but we don't want to wear ourselves out. And so, Lord, please show us the one thing. Help us see who you are, hear what you're saying and join in. We're going to respond to him in a variety of ways. Some of you will want to respond just deep in the quiet of your own place where you're sitting, and that's fine. For some people, some sort of response helps you to go, 
Yeah, no, that's me. I, I, from this moment on, I really want that. So uh, in a variety of ways, as we, as we worship, if you're somebody who recognises that your cup has drained to completely empty and has been empty for a long time, and you've been running on empty for a long time, join the club, but I would love to pray for you. It's, uh, it won't be magic, it's just the start of a journey, but I'd love to pray for you. And, and to do that, I would invite you to come and get your cup at some point during the worship time and just stand here and I'll pray for you. And if you're somebody who is a leader in business, uh, in a place of business where well-being is a bit of an issue and you could take a lead on something there, I don't know what that looks like, but it's something I felt when I was driving up here. I'd love to pray for you. So if you bring your cup, I'd love to pray over you. Um, and if you work in education, I would love to pray for you. Not just the work off the church, but the work of the church is going on everywhere, right? I'd love to pray for you if you're in mental health services. Um, it'll just be a blessing. And if you feel there's a sense in you that for calling towards doing something around the area of mental health, I'd also love to, to pray for you. And, and I think in terms of doing that, your symbolic act might be get your cup as we're worshipping and come and stand with your empty cup at the front. Um, and I, I won't ask for details or pray anything much. Just some of us will just lay hands on you and pray for you and uh, bless what God's already doing. Um, in the other category, if you are somebody who is struggling with your mental health, bless you for being here today. Well done. You are now the experts in what God is doing in this nation. I, I don't particularly want to pray for you. I just want to release you to... Have a voice in your churches because they need to hear your voice.